Mr. Jonas, please proceed. Let us, let us examine further JF 39's tale of Stanisic's intimate relationship with Martic and Stanisic's role as the channel of communication for Milosevic. Apparently, that relationship was so intimate and affectionate that Martic often referred to Stanisic as my brother and said he trusted him 100%. And yet, according to JF39, and discussed in our brief at paragraphs 302 to 320 particularly, in June 1991, Martic threw Samatovic out of Kanin in order to seize full control over his police and TO. As I've mentioned, according to JF 39, Stanisic's supplies of weapons stopped, well, according to one version of JF 39's account, Stanisic's supplies of weapons stopped in May or June of 1991. As discussed in our closing brief at paragraph 78, in early March of 1992, Martic ordered Rajic, Simatovic, Stasovic, and Olovic to be arrested because, and I quote, these men all worked directly for Simatovic and were members of the Serbian DB. JF39 claimed at T7282 that Martic attempted to arrest these men, effectively dissolving the Kraina DB, because he believed that Orlovic was passing information more to Stanisic than to him. JF31 offered some corroboration of that account, noting that Martic's principal grievance was that he never received correct information. Your Honours will find that at paragraph 79 of our brief. Dracha at transcript 16778 confirmed that Martic had an ongoing dispute with Stanisic and the Serbian DB. It was only in January 1993 that very limited contact was re-established between the RSK <coughs> DB and the Serbian DB. <coughs> if we could turn to slide 40 to, to finish this chronology. As we discuss at paragraph 1118 of our brief, on the 4th of October 1994, Martic accused Stanisic of using Kostic and Kojic to undermine his authority including kidnapping his Minister of Interior, Prilic, or Prijic, in August of 1994, and detaining Martic himself on the border crossing. Slide 40 contains part of a phone call Martic made to Milosevic. As we can see, Martic was refusing to meet Stanisic in 1994, claiming <coughs> that Stanisic is, quote, tripping me at every step and causes trouble. This is really below any level. So as this brief chronology shows, from June 1991, according to JF39 himself, Martic attempted to remove the Serbian DB's alleged influence from the Kraina. And yet, despite this clear evidence of Martic's relatively consistent paranoia that Stanisic and the Serbian DB were undermining his authority, Your Honours are supposed to conclude that Martic regarded Stanisic as his brother and trusted him 100%. That is not to argue that Stanisic was never in contact with Martic. That would be preposterous. It would be as unrealistic as a proper proposition that any contact or assistance to the RSK must have been in furtherance of crime. 
it would have been negligent to decline to form any relationship with Martic, given the implications of Martic's clumsy leadership for the security of Serbia. At paragraph 669 of the prosecution's closing brief, the prosecution claims that Milosevic's own words confirm Stanisic's role as a liaison between himself and Martic. They claim that, quote, in one intercepted conversation in September 1991, regarding a protocol for a ceasefire in the SAO Kraina, Milosevic said to Karadzic, so I told you of it, sir, as he was in contact with Milan to say that Martic should sign this technical protocol. Unfortunately, the prosecution's position declines to distinguish conduct in furtherance of crime and contact with the leadership of the RSK to advance peace. Being tasked by Milosevic to have Martic sign a European Union sponsored peace protocol is one thing, coordinating supplies to further crimes quite another. As will be outlined in the remainder of this closing, Stanisic's role with regard to such peace initiatives is well documented. To this extent, he might be considered a channel of communication. His contact with Martic to urge him to sign an agreement or protocol as a step towards peace was the first of many other attempts to further peace initiatives. From the Wine and Dents Peace Conference to Vance to Dayton and beyond. We say this evidence is indisputable and stands in marked contrast to the thrust of the prosecution case. If we could turn to slide 41, please. The prosecution falls into the same error with regard to Stanisic's role assisting with implementing the Vance plan. At paragraphs 82 to 84 of the prosecution final brief, the prosecution assert that P686, an intercepted conversation between Karadzic and Stanisic, dated the 7th of January 1992, shows that, quote, Stanisic played an integral role in, in the shaping of the soon-to-be RSK's government concept, making government appointments, planning military police activities in SPWS, and consolidating Serbian territories outside of Serbia. This slide contains the relevant part of that conversation. Despite the prosecution attempt to extrapolate from that conversation, a cursory examination of this intercept shows Karadzic and Stanisic were talking about the difficulties of having the Vance plan implemented. Nothing to do, stretch as one might, with forcible removal of Croats from Croatia. The fact that the prosecution relies upon it is an eloquent illustration of the frailty of their case. This conversation, and others we will see in a moment, stands as a rebuttal of the role Stanisic is alleged to have played. It's an illustration of his lack of criminal intent. If we could go to the next slide, please. Actually, bef before we do, your honours will see Stanisic in the 7th of January 1992 expressing his frustration with the lack of political activity there 
the RSK, we can agree with the prosecution on that. As he says, because all these people are complete incompetent jerks and immature as well. I had trouble explaining them to, to be patient and to get serious and get to work. Stanisic notes, he met 44 commanders to explain the situation and notes the discontent that exists there. You have the next slide, please. The same conversation. Stanisic is, we suggest, pulling his hair out with frustration. He refers to the leadership of the RSK as fierce Chekniks. There are a lot of radical people there who are angry at the entire world. They are sitting in these border areas for a year and are fighting. Do you understand? Stanisic says he's going to make a round on the field and make some, comp some kind of concept. The idea that this intercept stands as proof of Stanisic's warlike activities or his integral role in the shaping of the RSK government's concept as a furtherance of a criminal purpose is a fanciful proposition. He was doing his level best to engineer a concept that would reduce the discontent of those war commanders who, rather than implementing Vance or moving towards peace, had other ideas. Does this name-calling from Stanisic, his obvious frustration, sound like a man who had played the critical role coordinating their activities and their crimes? Or someone who admired their work? Or someone who had a vested interest in their warlike activities? Or shared, more importantly, any criminal intent? Can we turn to slide 43, please? The prosecution's unreasonable approach to Stanisic's alleged role as the facilitator of the JCE is even more apparent with regard to Babbage. This is dealt with in paragraphs 20, 669 to 671 of the prosecution brief. Slide 43 sums up the claimed support for this alleged role. Let us examine this proposition that the prosecution claims stands at, as dispositive proof of Stanisic's contribution to the JCE. It's a stark illustration of the dangerous ruse at the heart of the prosecution case. As your honours will discover through an examination of footnotes 2324 <coughs> to 2326, the prosecution brief, entitled Channel of Communication, there is not a single piece of evidence to suggest that Stanisic facilitated Babich's contact with Milosevic, let alone shared his extremist views. How that allegation sits with the parallel structure thesis is yet to be explained. On the contrary, there can be little doubt that Stanisic regarded him quite accurately on one view, even though it's not nice to speak ill of the dead, as one of the radical, incompetent and immature jerks in the RSK leadership that stood in the way of the Vance plan. The prosecution provides one example of Stanisic's alleged coordinating role with Babbage. We could turn to slide 44, please. The example is that Stanisic facilitated the Vance plan. <coughs> Slide 44, 45, 46, and 47 reflect excerpts of P683, <coughs> P686, 87, 
and P690. All conversations between Karadzic and Stanisic in January of 1992. Because the prosecution declined to distinguish conduct in furtherance of crime from other conduct, they claim that these conversations support their case. On the contrary, we urge your honours to examine these intercepts. They offer a window into Mr. Stanisic's mind. His contemporaneous repudiation of Babich's radical attitude and his attempts to have the Vance plan implemented, a plan that offered the only prospect that Croats might be able to return home. As slide 44 shows, on the 5th of January 1992, Stanisic explains how he has tried without success to tie Babich down. Karadzic notes that he could spoil things, meaning obviously, the Vance plan. In slide 45, we can turn to that. The men can be seen, Karadzic and Stanisic, on the 7th of January, continuing that theme. Karadzic, in characteristically colourful language, suggests that the army should grab Babic by the balls to force him to sign the Vance plan. Your Honours will note that it is Karadzic, not Stanisic, who acts as the peacemaker between Babic and Martic. Stanisic notes that Babic's, quote, radical attitude towards everybody can finish really bad. Turn to slide 46, please. Your Honours, uh, if one looks at slides 46, 47, 48 and 49, these are excerpts from the conversations on the 12th and the 22nd of January 92. Slide 46 has Karadzic informing Stanisic that he made a plan with Babic to go see Milosevic. It's noteworthy that he has to inform Stanisic of that fact. If Stanisic was the facilitator between Babic and Milosevic, surely he would have made that arrangement, not Karadzic. Both men agree that a favorable ending is only a step away. Stanisic expresses his fear there'll be a total war. That's what he is afraid of. In slide 42, both men agree that their conversation means nothing. They have to tell those that disagree with them. They make a plan to act. They may to make a plan to meet and act. Stanisic notes that he does not want to be shown as part of the initiative. Slide 48 contains excerpts from exhibit P690. A conversation the two men had on the 22nd of January 1992. Karadzic and Stanisic discussed the way forward and how Karadzic has negotiated with Babic to come to a compromise, to allow the Kraina to express some reservations with the Vance plan. <coughs> Stanisic notes his relief. Stanisic, uh, sorry, slide 49 contains the only remark in this whole case spanning more than five years of ethnic conflict that provides an iota of evidence to support a suggestion that Stanisic might have harbored ill feelings to the Croat population. It is worthwhile examine this, examining this conversation in context and in the context of the frustration that both men have clearly shown with Babich and the RSK leadership. Karadzic notes the undesirability of war continuing in the RSK, stating that, quote, 
Nobody will win. We will all be impoverished and ruined. He notes that without Tujman and the Croatian Serbs showing some elasticity and goodwill, they will be in for 30 years of torture. Stanisic concurs, noting that they must push them all to Belgrade. He notes with obvious frustration, there's nothing left for us to do or we'll exterminate them completely, so let's see where we end up. If they want it, then they'll have an all-out war. Better to do it like decent people. The proposition that a single remark can stand as any evidence of Stanisic's criminal intent is a distortion of the remark and the context of the conversation. There is not a single person in this room who has not uttered in frustration an inflammatory remark or an overly aggressive comment that they regretted immediately. <coughs> Stanisic was obviously frustrated at the incompetence and reckless behaviour of both Babbage and Tudjman. That the prosecution is only able to offer this one remark throughout the whole of the indictment period is a cogent illustration of Mr. Stanisic's coolness under fire, his racial tolerance in the midst of a hateful conflict, and the falseness of this indictment. He knew there was no choice, sign the peace agreement like decent people, rather than continuing the war. He was tasked to help persuade the RSK leadership to sign the peace agreement. If that makes him a channel of communication, then so be it. We can turn to slide 50. Let us examine very briefly Stanisic's alleged role as coordinator of Hadjic's activities. Prosecution claimed that Stanisic coordinated the SPWS, <coughs> including the special units, the Red Berets, Arkan, the Scorpions, etc., through his coordinating relationship with Hadzic. Slide 50 contains the prosecution's principal allegations. These allegations are almost wholly unsubstantiated at best supported by patently unreliable hearsay. I've already outlined our position with regards to point five and six on slides, on the slides in front of you. I will not return to this obvious reversal of the burden and standard of proof. Slide 51 contains the single piece of evidence relied on in support of the allegation that Hadzic viewed Stanisic as the link between Milosevic and Badger. By stating that Hadzic told him this, but he can't say anything more than that, the witness Bogunovic fairly conceded the limited value of his own evidence a reasonable position to take with regard to this evidence and Hadzic and the breadth of the allegation sought to be established by this evidence. There is no reliable evidence that Badger was ever denied access to Milosevic. As we discuss in our final brief, Badger's subsequent and meteoric rise from Psy Commander to Deputy Minister of Interior, shows his closeness to the SPS party stalwart Sokolovic, Minister of Interior, which in turn stands as cogent evidence of a relationship with Milosevic. As slide 52 shows, we can turn to that. The prosecution also alleges that Hadzic implemented recommendations and orders from Belgrade after meeting with Milosevic 
and Stanisic. Despite an impressively large footnote, most of the evidence relied upon in support of that concerns Milosevic, not Stanisic. The evidence that places Stanisic at these meetings is limited to two witnesses. The irrepressible Mr. Babich, never one to pass up an opportunity for fabrication or exaggeration, and Mr. Bogunovic. As slide 52 shows, both make assertions devoid of any of the type of detail that might turn an allegation into something concrete, let alone satisfy your honours of the truth beyond a reasonable doubt. It is impossible to be satisfied that Stanisic was present at the meetings. Even if he was present at the meetings, the prosecution has adduced no evidence that could satisfy this chamber that he was instructing or advising Hatzic. Your Honours will not be able to identify a single instruction or a piece of advice conveyed by Stanisic. Regarding Babich's evidence, let us apply the burden and standard of proof and recall Babich's evidence must be corroborated. It has not been and should be disregarded. Slide 53, if we can turn to that, <coughs> contains some excerpts from Bogunovic's evidence in relation to meetings he had with Stanisic. This has been ignored by the prosecution. Bogunovic was the Minister of Interior for the SPWS. If Stanisic was engaged in passing on Milosevic's instructions, it is logical to presume that he would not <coughs> limit this to instructions straight to Hadzic. Indeed, the implication of the prosecution case is that it extended to the whole of the SPWS government, from Koyic to, to Mergud and so on. And yet, on the rare occasion Bogunovic met Stanisic, as we discuss in the SPWS section of our brief, Stanisic did not speak. He sat and took notes. As we discuss in paragraph 432 of our closing brief, this is precisely what the evidence shows he did when he met the Minister of Defence during the five meetings he had from 1991 to 1995. These meetings concerned updates on political events, refugees, and once again, the implementation of the Vance Plan. Silence and taking notes is curious behaviour for a man whose principal task was to pass instructions from Milosevic to the SPWS government. Passing information to Milosevic on these types of security-related subjects is one thing. Passing instructions and orders in furtherance of crime, something quite different. Slide 53 sums up some of Bogunovic's evidence that is relevant to that submission. Slide 54. The prosecution wants you to accept Stanisic was the link between Milosevic and Arkan and Badger, through whom Milosevic exerted influence over Hadzic on the ground. Slide 53 contains the evidence relied upon. The prosecution th should think twice before accusing a man of being linked with our camp. It really needs to be based on more than a witness's assumption. Finally, the prosecution allege that in the capacity of facilitator, Stanisic arrived in Dahl in mid-September of 1991, expressing outrage that Vukova had not yet fallen to the Serbs. <coughs> demanded a meeting with Hadzic, 
a meeting which would further the common purpose with respect to Vukovar. During the meeting, Stanisic, it is alleged, planned operations to liberate Vukovar as soon as possible. Let us analyze that for a moment. No longer working in the shadows, but bellowing in public like a market trader selling his wares. If the prosecution were interested in contextualization, they would not have relied upon this allegation. No witness but JF32 heard Stanisic or heard of Stanisic turning up in Dal and screaming. Bogunovic, according to the witness at T4757, was supposed to be present at the screaming. JF29 was, according to JF32 at transcript 4759, supposed to have been present at the planned meeting. At transcript 6044, Bogunovic confirmed he'd never heard of such an event. Neither Bogunovic, the Minister of Interior, or JF29 offered a scintilla of evidence to corroborate this fabricated, largely hearsay tale. As critically, there is not a single piece of other evidence to suggest that Stanisic was involved with planning the book of our operations. One would have thought that at least one insider in this trial, or any other trial, would have learned of such a role. The prosecution seeks to persuade you that a professional counterintelligence officer and had such a warehouse manager by trade sat down and helped to plan the biggest military operation of that time. Oddly, nobody but JF32, from the leadership of the ASBWS to those in the JNA, appear to have noticed such an important contribution to one of the biggest crimes in this terrible war. Of course, it's a lie. Could we turn to slide 55, please? Finally, we turn to the prosecution's originating premise concerning Bosnia. As with the Croatian crime bases, the, their case rests on Stanisic being a channel of communication, or as they put it at paragraph 65, 675 and 676, a gatekeeper and liaison between Milosevic and Karadzic, which parallels Stanisic's role vis-à-vis -vis Matic, Babic and Hadzic. This originating premise is a critical part of the prosecution case. It cannot sensibly be suggested that Stanisic had any real relationship with Mladic. As the Mladic notebooks make clear, Stanisic was only introduced to him in July 1993. Mladic, as I've said, did not have Stanisic's number until 1995. Milovanovic thought Stanisic was a waiter in early 1993. So Stanisic cannot have been coordinating through that military line. It must have been through the political line. This political relationship allegedly allowed him to parachute Arkan's men and the Scorpions at will into the VRS zone of responsibility. No doubt Mladic will claim it had nothing to do with him. As we can see from slide 55, the prosecution makes various allegations concerning Stanisic's relationship with Karadzic. The most startling feature of these expansive claims is the evidence relied upon to establish Stanisic's role during the five-year indictment period is evidence that comes from intercepts from July 1991 until January 1992 and a diary that places Stanisic on the 6th of September 1991 at a meeting with Bogdanovich, who is clearly acting as a contact man for Jovic, involved, we would say, in limited supply to vulnerable Serbian villages in Bosnia. 
Even if the prosecution's interpretation of these intercepts does disclose that Stanisic was, at the time, coordinating Milosevic's supply of weapons or his political project, the inference the prosecution urges is astonishing. Despite a whole military campaign, the creation of new political structures, the transformation of the JNA into the VRS, and a myriad of other criminal and non-criminal events, the prosecution suggests that you can be satisfied that Stanisic maintained this relationship through the indictment period. An ambitious inference indeed. Not because they can point to circumstantial evidence of that relationship continuing, oral testimony, documentary evidence such as assembly minutes, Karadic's diary, which was on the 65 tour list, the Miladic notebooks, intelligence reports, or even the usual multiple hearsay evidence that is a regrettable feature of this case, but because of a handful of conversations before the war. Slides 56 and 57 contain a selection of the adjudicated facts in this case. They place the Bosnian Serbs movement to war in some chronological context. Even if Stanisic was given carte blanche by Milosevic to supply Bosnian Serb villages with weapons in late 1991, or facilitated the political events until January 1992, it is difficult, we submit, to see how this could have been linked to this criminal purpose. In the words of the prosecution's requested third adjudicated fact, number 97, it was only during 1992 when the SDS started contemplating military conflict as a likelihood and no longer as a mere possibility. Calls to take over territory became, quote, strong and distinct only at the beginning of January 1992. At paragraphs 88 to 117, the prosecution discussed these inter intercepted conversations under the title Implementation of the JCE in Bosnia. It includes, or they include, various accusations concerning Karadic's and Stanisic's alleged belligerence, suggesting that neither man was seriously interested in peace. We submit that these allegations, even if taken at face value and accurate, have little to do with this trial. But on the contrary, the allegations made by the prosecution and the provocative title, Implementation of the JC in Bosnia, are designed to persuade Your Honour that a criminal purpose began in Bosnia at the same time as the one in Croatia, and for one reason only. The best evidence of Mr. Stanisic's involvement with Karadic began at that time and ended in January of 92. Moreover, this evidence does not even begin to prove that Stanisic was not interested in peace, let alone that he was pursuing crime. A reasonable interpretation of the relevant intercepts show precisely the reverse. First of all, the very premise of the prosecution's allegations are dubious to say the least. Your Honours are invited to believe that even though Stanisic was doing his best to tie Babich down, speak to 44 discontented commanders and deal with the Chechniks of the RSK, simultaneously was determined to pursue war in Bosnia. Why would a man who has castigated the RSK leadership betray such a lack of logic? In order to reinterpret the intercepts, the prosecution's cut, cut and paste events, people and motivations 
to prove a point that has no basis in the evidence. If your honours have the prosecution's closing brief, if you would turn par up paragraphs 94 to 95 of the prosecution brief, here the prosecution cut and paste from Karadic's comments in August 1991 to the effect that the Bosnian Serbs should do everything that Brezhnev is thinking, and then suggest that Karadic's comments are chilling in light of extreme views that Brezhnev held in 1992, where he advocated forcible transfer. A nice photograph at paragraph 95 of Stanisic and Samatovic, the latter wearing a military uniform, indisputably from much later than this time, standing next to Karadic, nicely completes the exercise in unfair assertion. At paragraph 96 of the prosecution closing, they take Stanisic's role in attempting to prevent war and spin it to suggest the reverse. The prosecution claims that Stanisic's involvement with Brajanin demonstrates his authority in Bosnia by August of 1991. As I've said, of course, even if that was true, it might not be true at a time when the political and military events had been transformed and the calls to take over territory had become more distinct. It was quite possible to have influence in August 1991 and little in 1992. In fact, the burden of proof we submit demands that your honours presume precisely that until proven otherwise. Moreover, it is of course possible to use influence for good, even if crimes were on the rise. An examination of the relevant intercepts and the role Stanisic appears to have played shows precisely that. Slide 58 shows the role that Stanisic played at that time. Similar to his efforts in Croatia, he kept his head when all around was losing theirs. He took Bradgen in fishing to calm him down and prevent him from doing anything stupid so that the Bosnian Serbs would not derail the negotiations. Alia would then have to tell the Muslims why they wanted to wage war against the Serbs, as stated by Karadic. He, Alia, would have to explain it. We submit that the reality appears to be that Stanisic in 1991 was regarded as a man who might play a role in calming the excesses of others, preventing war and advancing towards peace. His role appears to have extended to Bosnia as well as Croatia. It was a role he played later with regard to Dayton and a myriad of other activities that we say helped to bring peace and stability to the region. Try as they might to interpret Mr. Stanisic's role alternatively or cast aspersions on his motives, there is a consistent line in these intercepts of Stanisic playing a positive role. This is further demonstrated in a conversation between Karadic and Milosevic on the 8th of October 1991. Slide 59 and 60 are excerpts from that conversation. We return to the RSK. Milosevic notes that the RSK leadership will not even turn up for the peace conference negotiations. He notes that one man, probably Babic, thinks that everyone should get down on their knees when he shows up. Both men seem to agree that Stanisic should be asked to get involved to find a way to get the leadership to turn up to the peace conference. They agree that Stanisic should invite ten of the smart ones from the opposition to come to a meeting to find a way forward. <clears throat> Once again, the prosecution declines to draw distinctions between actions in furtherance of peace and actions in furtherance of crime. 
prosecution, paragraph 679 of their brief, claims that this conversation is an illustration of the integral role played by Stanisic in the relationship between Karadzic and Milosevic. As we discuss in our closing brief, the State Security Service was not built for war, nor did Stanisic have those skills. There were plenty of men who could prosecute the war, and very few had the political nuance and the diplomatic skills to keep a cool head. When the war suited Milosevic or Karadzic's aims, others, from Perisic to Mladic, to Arkan to Badger, were required. When a cool hand on the tiller was required, it appears Stanisic, a man schooled in counterintelligence, a perfect training for diplomacy, perhaps, could play a role. If we are to extrapolate from these 1991 and early 1992 intercepts to make large claims concerning their significance throughout the indictment period, let us extrapolate from a reasonable interpretation of the conversations. Having influence and authority is not an indication of criminal intent. And so to move to section three of our speech and our concluding remarks. The evidence that Stanisic was number two to Milosevic, or more importantly, that he played a coordinating role in the war, is devoid of evidential support. If we are right about this, then alongside the collapse of the 28 elite trainer thesis, what is left? As we've outlined in detail, in order to compensate for the lack of evidence, the prosecution have attempted to build a new case through ignoring the strictures of JC law and urging unreasonable inferences based on a partial view of the evidence. This will not assist with the ascertainment of the truth. The careful distinctions that need to be drawn to find the truth and to ensure that justice is done are not to be found in the prosecution's final brief. It's transparently a, a highlight of the most incriminatory aspects of the evidence, untroubled by reflections on reliability or credibility. It incorporates an attempt to rebuild the house using new sand, whilst insisting that the sand has a significant relationship to something more substantial. The reality is that the prosecution thesis is unrealistic. They, not the defence, are running from the evidence. We confront the evidence in our final brief and we offer reasonable explanations. A practical demonstration of the approach that must be taken to the burden and standard of proof. If I, with the greatest of respect, can offer the type of analysis that Mr. Stanisic's case deserves, and which the prosecution case seeks to avoid, by referring you to slide 61 and allegation 6. In an attempt to link Stanisic to Dragon, the prosecution relies upon P671, an intercepted conversation from the 29th of November 1991, that they claim at paragraph 99 of their final brief, demonstrates that Stanisic intended to engage Captain Dragon and Samatovic to assist Karadzic in the way that they had already assisted Martic. It's a forgery. It's obvious. Slide 61 contains the salient parts of this purportedly authentic intercept. It's the only intercept we dispute. It is the only intercept out of 97 produced by uh, a witness 
that has no corresponding audio tape to verify its authenticity. And that, of course, creates some doubt concerning its authenticity. That makes it especially important to look at it in context. First, as we discuss at paragraph 1036 of our closing brief, there is evidence that the Bosnian Serb leadership from at least mid-1994 adopted a policy of blaming the Serbian MUP, characterizing them as extremists, paramilitaries, and destroying incriminatory document documents. That makes a forgery a bit more likely. Have the prosecution removed that doubt through providing corroborative support? The prosecution has not adduced a single piece of evidence to corroborate this so-called intercept and its claim that in November 1991, Stanisic was commanding Dragon and Samatovic on military operations in the RSK. We suggest there's not even a single piece of evidence to suggest that Stanisic commanded Dragon or directed him in war operations whether in Kinin or otherwise, let alone at a time when Golovic was closed and Dragon was offering his services to the highest bidder. Precisely which town were Dragon and Samasevic advancing on? Why have the prosecution failed to adduce a single piece of evidence other than an enthusiastic greeting at Kula that suggests Stanisic did in fact send Dragon to Bosnia? A kiss is just a kiss and a hug is just a hug and meaningful evidence of concerted action in pursuit of crime, something quite, quite different. A further examination of the context leaves the matter in further doubt. As your honours will have seen, according to P651, on the 8th of December 1991, Milosevic and Karadzic nominated Stanisic as the man to sit down with ten men from the RSK opposition to force Babich's hand. A role which is extended to 44 commanders in January 1992. And yet according to this allegedly authentic intercept, Stanisic was simultaneously conducting operations with Dragon as well as with the Red Berets, as well as with Arkan, as well as with the Scorpions and so on and so forth, in the Kraina and the SPWS. It's illogical, and obviously so. In our respectful submission, that short analysis is the type of analysis that this case deserves. The burden and standard of proof is high. It is wholly unsatisfactory to rely upon evidence only because, if looked through narrowed eyes and without any context, it prejudices the accused. We submit an analysis of this evidence reveals a manifest lack of reliability, which when combined with the evidence of Stanisic's contributions to peace, leads to a reasonable conclusion that Stanisic lacked criminal intent. Why was it that Stanisic was chosen to negotiate with Mladic for the release of the Umpafor hostages? As we detail in Annex 2 of our closing brief, this was uh, reportedly one of the most sensitive crises in the Balkans. The prosecution can do as they might to diminish the value of this act by suggesting Stanisic's motives were not pure but it does not deal with the central question. Why him? Why not Perisic, who, as we know, had an intimate relationship with Mladic? Why not a myriad of other men? No one can seriously suggest that Mladic, the commander of thousands of VRS troops, was fearful of Stanisic or his JATD. No evidence exists that Stanisic had an ongoing relationship with Mladic, let alone one of intimacy or affection. The prosecution claimed yesterday that the, the fact that Stanisic was able to go and negotiate that release shows he had significant influence.
but over who? As the Mladic diaries show, he only met Mladic in July 93, and in 1995 they'd not even exchanged phone numbers. So why Stanisic? We suggest the answer lies in the character of the man. It's the same answer to the question why in 1991 and 92 <coughs> was Stanisic apparently engaged with persuading the RSK leadership to sign the, sign the Vance plan. That answer may help to understand why Stanisic from 1991, when madness swirled around the Balkans, continued to cultivate relationship with pivotal intelligence services from abroad. Or why, as the Chief of State Security, he was chosen to negotiate Dayton? Or why, after Dayton, he helped to secure the safety of ongoing peace operations. We refer you on us to Annex 2 of our closing brief. You don't have to take my word for it, Your Honours. May we go into private sessions, please? We we'll move into private session. Open session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edison. Why is it that Stanisic did not join Milosevic's party at any time during the indictment period? Why is it that he was against members of the DB joining any political party? Why is it that most DB centres had a multi ethnic composition? Why was it that not a single Muslim was removed from his service during the war? Why did he allow Zlatko Radnic, Croat, to remain chief of the sixth administration throughout the war? We invite you to look at Annex 2 of our brief. You will see this to be undoubtedly true. Radnic was still employed in 1996 and accompanied Stanisic on high-level visits abroad. The prosecution asks you to ignore these assessments. of Stanisic is a non-political and moderate man provided by men of integrity and worth, and instead accept the evidence of unsavory characters such as JF 39 or JF 47, who couldn't decide whether he was in an RSK MUP unit <coughs> or a Serbian MUP unit. Or witnesses like Kovacevic or JF 005, who may still be looking for their notes in their kitchen cupboards. Or the incorrigible Tunans, with his expressions of gratitude for his long-standing employment with the prosecution at the ICTY. Mr. Stanisic was a pragmatist, not a nationalist or an extremist. He had a job to do that involved at its core, as we outline in Annex 1 of our brief, to oppose all forms of extreme nationalist activity. In order to prevent an intra-national conflict, a civil war and terrorism, why could a Croat remain in such a high position in the DB? And yet that was impossible for other state organs because this state organ was not prosecuting a war against Croats. And unlike other state organs, having an ethnically diverse membership was an asset to its work. As I noted at the outset, Stanisic did not believe in a greater Serbia depending upon expanding land or territory. As early as 1992, if not before, Stanisic knew that it was not possible to hold Yugoslavia together, let alone achieve the more grandiose ambitions of the nationalists and extremists within Serbia. Uh, not to be shown to the public, please. Slides 63 and 64. This is a conversation Stanisic had with Karadic, which we say provides another insight into his mind. From early on in this terrible war, a position he took on the 5th of January 1992, Karadic was excited about a speech he'd given in a convention 
that was televised. Stanisic watched the speech and spoke to Karadzic. Stanisic was guarded in his praise of the convention and Karadzic's speech. He did not say he liked it. He said that he observed that others did. Quote, we were watching you carefully and that applause you got. Whereas Karadzic char characterizes his speech as non-elitist, Stanisic is careful to note that he, Karadzic, is orthodox, clearly a euphemism for extreme. He notes that it is the orthodox lefties that got most from it. Finally, Karadzic notes that he wants Yugoslavia as a whole. Stanisic notes that he is wondering the same thing, but finally notes that he does not know how this would be possible. I suggest that this shows, or is at least some evidence of, Stanisic, the pragmatist, who knew that it was not possible. His own, in his own quiet way, he tried to urge Karadzic to be realistic. Stanisic knew the world didn't work like that, even if died in the wool nationalists, like <coughs> Babic, Martic, Hadzic and Karadzic did not. He knew that this political aim was impossible, even though he had to be circumspect when speaking to Karadzic. If that's right, or might be right, what was Mr. Stanisic's political objective? How could he have thrown himself into prosecuting a war when he did not share a belief in his political objectives, or share a belief that they were possible? How could he have thrown himself into committing crimes, considered by others to be integral to the achievement of a uh, unified Yugoslavia, if he doubted from early on that it was not possible? How could he have shared that criminal intent? As the Balkans erupted, Stanisic's job was to prevent Serbia erupting too. His job was critical. Others were perfectly capable and militarily trained to direct and organize the formation of special units to finance, train and provide logistical support to those special units as well as leading them into battle in furtherance of crimes. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Mr. Jorash. I think it's time for a break. We will take a break and we'll resume at five minutes to six o'clock and will it be you, Mr. Bakac, or you, Mr. Petrovic, who will then address the court. Yes, Your Honor. I will address you with your leave. We resume at five minutes to six. All right.